introducing uh, Dr. Stacy Williams. Um, she got her PhD from Kent State University with a major in social psychology and a minor in health psychology. Um, she's been here um, as a professor of psychology, uh, recently promoted last year, I believe, um, at ETSU. She's also the director of social issues and relations lab, um, as well as the chair of the institutional review board here at ETSU. Um, so she'll be giving us a wonderful lecture today, so please give her a big round of applause. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Um, I am going to talk with you about my work in LGBTQ mental health and talk with you a bit about my research as well as how I see um, this work related to practice. So prior to getting started, I'll acknowledge my disclosure of no conflicts. Uh, and then I'd like to just give you a brief overview of what we'll be covering today, what you can expect to take away from the talk. Um, so first we're going to cover what are health disparities, so LGBTQ specific mental health disparities, and what are some common explanations, one in particular, for those health disparities, mental health disparities. So I'll be telling you about two specific research studies to give some example. Um, and then we'll end with some discussion of how I see um, this work having implications for practice. As a result, of course, what I think your learning objectives are. Um, hopefully you will walk away with understanding some of the mental health disparities that exist for this particular population. What one common explanation for that disparity might be. Um, as well as how you might think about this work in relation to your own practice. In 2011, the Institute of Medicine, now under another name of course, um, came out with a report that talked about the state of LGBTQ health, and it wasn't good, essentially. So essentially, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, individuals fared worse on health outcomes. And so this call went out to basically figure out what is going on with this population, how can we reduce these disparities. And you'll see along the left-hand side that minority stress, life course perspective, intersectionality or appreciating multiple identities within individuals at one time, and then social ecology were um, areas of focus, and then of course some priority research areas that are needed. So what I'm gonna cover today really stems or is encouraged by this report. So what are disparities? Obviously the word disparity means difference. Um, and in fact the reality is that this community experiences a lot of disparities. Uh, and we're gonna cover what a few of those, both mental health and physical health related disparities are according to the research. So to give you some examples, in mental health related outcomes, we see greater levels of psychological distress, outcomes like depression, anxiety, suicidality, as well as other health outcomes. So cardiovascular issues, health behaviors in the form of um, tobacco use, substance use, obesity. So health behaviors, health outcomes, mental health outcomes, essentially worse in this population uh, overall compared to the um, counterparts that are from majority groups. So heterosexual individuals, cisgender individuals, which are when um, individuals' gender identity matches their assigned sex at birth. So seeing across the board kind of this trend of disparities. Now importantly, um, it's important to note that these disparities aren't really attributable to anything inherently bad about this population. That really it stems from exposure to what we refer to as minority stress. 
So the minority identity, and throughout today you'll hear me talk about the LGBTQ community um, in terms of sexual and gender minority as well. So I'll be using those interchangeably. Essentially that minority identity comes to be linked with health, that negative health outcome, through this stress process. So we're all familiar with the stress process, but this is a minority specific process. So that stress attached to a minority identity. And this can come in the form of the way that people think um, in the culture. This can be stemming from interpersonal exchanges and discrimination. It can be the way that individuals think about themselves, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, in the subsequent slides. But all of this sort of minority stress that is experienced is also mediated, so it's not directly necessarily linked with negative health, but psychologically mediated, physiologically mediated, so that we see it impacting things like coping and the way that people um, interact or don't interact with other people and the way they think about themselves in the world. So it's mediated by these other processes. And of course, this minority stress process is probably sounding familiar because it definitely draws from the general stress process, which has stress as a transaction between the social environment and individual. So it's very similar to the stress process overall, just thinking about very specifically related to that identity, how do we see unique stress because of identity? So we all experience stress. We're not saying that stress just occurs in minorities, but it's this sort of additional unique stress that they encounter. You may also, um, in your mind, be thinking, this sounds a lot like discrimination. This sounds a lot like stigma. And you're absolutely right. So if we apply a stigma framework, we see that stigma can happen at multiple levels. We're probably all familiar with these levels. So if you think about that structural level, things like institutions and society as a whole, we know that there's discrimination and unfair um, policies that exist. Interpersonally, of course, stigma can take the form of um, discrimination in social interactions. So that interpersonal exchange that occurs. And then finally this more internalized piece that um, means that the individual who's stigmatized actually might take that inward and start to believe those negative attributes and the societal hate and really think negatively toward the self, holding negative self-related beliefs. So these are kind of happening all at the same time. I'm really interested in this region, because I'm here. And so I'm curious about how is it that this social culture plays a role in this minority stress? How does it present itself? And if you think theoretically about these three types of stigma, and then you think about this region, or Tennessee as a whole, perhaps we can start to piece together what the social experience might be like. So at a structural level, we know that state policies exist. And I think of one in particular, which is um, the one that allows for counselors to discriminate um, and turning the LGBTQ community away um, and not seeing them for counseling. At an interpersonal level, we know that um, institutions like religion, um, cultural attitudes, that these can often play a role interpersonally and contribute to unfair treatment that happens. And then, of course, the internalization can happen. And with considering all of the other structures, as well as this region of perhaps some economic distress and fewer social supports, for example, no brick and mortar um, centers or resources out in the community for the LGBTQ individuals to seek support. Um, you can see all of this potentially exacerbating their experience of minority stress. This is just sort of at a 
theoretical level right now. In fact, the Williams Institute had this same thought and decided, let's conceptualize this community or regional or social context into the form of social climate. So social climate, you can think of kind of akin to temperature gauge. So we might have warmer climates where we're kind of feeling good and accepted, and chilly climates, colder climates where we're feeling not accepted and not welcomed. So if you think of it in that nature, well, they took some national data. So they had four data sources nationally um, and took some data points from those sources that they thought would reflect social climate toward the LGBTQ community. So they took that data and they mapped the United States. So on this slide, you see the temperature, so to speak, um, via different colors. And the pinker colors are the warmer states based on more accepting attitudes held by the people in those regions. And then the really dark blue areas are those less well, warm and welcoming, so the chillier regions. Um, and of course, I'm sure your eyes went immediately to find Tennessee, um, and we see that it's that darker blue color. So that chillier climate is how our state fares in terms of social climate toward LGBTQ people. So we have some initial evidence uh, for this idea of social climate mattering for minority stress um, in this population. So I'm going to tell you about my first study of two today. And this study is funded by the National Institute of Mental Health. And our goal of this study was to develop a resource and to test the initial efficacy of that resource. It's an online resource to help people cope with minority stress in this region. I'm actually not going to tell you about that part, um, maybe at a subsequent <laughs> psychiatry grand rounds. Um, but I'm going to focus really on phase one, because that's the part that we've been really into right now, coding all of the qualitative interviews that we conducted with LGBTQ emerging adults, so ages 18 to 29, about their experience in this region. So we recruited people from basically the six counties that surround us, and we interviewed them about their minority stress experience here. We also interviewed stakeholders who are um, essentially people that work with the LGBTQ community. They may or may not be in the community themselves. So we conducted these interviews, we conducted focus groups, we transcribed those interviews and focus groups, and we coded like mad <laughs> all of the data. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what themes we're seeing in those results. So first theme is this idea that we have this experience of safe and unsafe space that actually, rather than a space itself that is safe, that individuals in our community are seen as the safe places. So in other words, I mentioned earlier, we don't have any brick and mortar places or actual physical spaces devoted to supporting the LGBTQ community and that is showing up here, where individuals themselves are actually the safe space. Second, we, we tapped into this, what we described as this deep isolation, where they're isolated from role models, so they're not seeing role models for them. They get rejecting uh, behaviors from religious institutions, from family, so really lacking of support resources. And there also was some evidence of that in the healthcare arena, which I'm also going to cover um, in some of the samples of the excerpts that I'm going to give you today. So if you think about it, with resources limited, these stressors may actually be exacerbated in this region. So we're beginning to see that play out with our actual qualitative data. So here's a, an excerpt 
from an actual interview that we conducted with a 20-year-old gay white male. And I bolded some of the pieces just so that you can pull out um, the central meaning. So I'll go ahead and read it. Being um, a member of any marginalized community, but including the LGBT community, can be even more challenging to navigate. It would almost be easier to be in a place where there was no place that was safe or safe place, because you know how to function. But we're in a place where you don't know if it's good or if it's bad. You could literally be on one side of the street and you have allies, and on the other side of the street, they could physically want to assault you. Here, I don't know what's safe or not because it's hit or miss, which I think sometimes can be more dangerous. So again, this idea of not knowing the safe place, that it's an actual individual rather than a place. An excerpt that illustrates the isolation. I was in my freshman math class in high school, and there was a teacher. She basically told the whole class that gay people should just go live on their own island and see how that works out as far as reproduction goes, because they'll just die off. Just made me feel like really lonely and just sort of like I was a piece of trash. So this person, who was a 20-year-old lesbian white female, speaks about her prior experience in high school. Another illustration deals with the trans community specifically. So this was one of our stakeholders that talked about their work with the trans community. So I can think of three transgender students in the past year that we've tried to work with. Oh, I can think of two others that, you know, parents kicked them out of the house, couldn't even go home during the summer, so they had to stay here. But if they can't receive financial aid because they can't get their parents' tax information, there's a risk of homelessness. You know, there are very real problems that we see in our office all the time. So I wasn't expecting this homelessness piece. It really kind of shook me to my core, to be honest. And we actually saw that um, coming out in some of the interviews, this idea of couch surfing because of being kicked out of a family home. We also saw this playing out in the context of healthcare through people's comments. So this was a 24-year-old bisexual white female and she spoke about how it's hard to find doctors that aren't like, oh, well, get out of my office. We don't treat your kind here. Leave. It's a pretty strong statement. Specifically regarding therapists, we had several people indicate there were no friendly therapists in this region. So this 28-year-old bisexual white female talks about how this intersection between um, lack of friendly therapists, and then who is covered by insurance, that that creates even more complexity with finding people. So <clears throat> you look at like the five people that are even in your network, three of them, um, their practice actually has the Christian family therapy or moral solutions. If there aren't more secular doctors who want to work here and practice here, then there really aren't a lot of options out there. So this complicated interaction with your insurance coverage. So because we saw in the themes such focus on this lack of friendly therapists, um, I created, you can't really see it here, it's a, a picture of the resource, but it's a list of friendly therapists um, in this region, essentially. And I started with the people that I knew who were friendly therapists, called them up and said, hey, do you want to be on this list? They said yes. And then I said, do you know anyone else who wants to be on this list? And I called them up, and so it sort of snowballed. But everyone on the list wants to be on the list and claims to be a friendly therapist. And we're trying to distribute this resource widely. Um, certainly within our research studies, we are, um, but also trying to get the word out into the community as well. So although we're creating this resource that I sort of alluded to, that hopefully will also contribute to this community and the support available, we also broke ground with just 
doing these interviews by putting some actual experience and words to what we think is happening. And so our research does call attention to this geographic region that is understudied, especially this population that is understudied. Okay, so moving a little bit deeper into the idea of minority stress, you know, we're talking about identity. And you know and I know that we're not just one identity. We have multiple identities going on as indicated by this figure, this picture. All at one time, we have this complex set of identities going on. And so minority stress then might be complicated by the fact that we are not solely one identity. So how do other identities sort of mix with the sexual or gender minority identity to create a unique experience that we should be talking about. So just to give you an example, um, I have a student who is in the room and is very much interested in um, how the race, racial ethnic identity kind of interacts or comes together with sexual identity. And if you think about um, a minority race and having a set of cultural expectations and values, those cultural expectations and values might conflict with sexual minority identity. And so this conflict and allegiance can happen that isn't present for perhaps other racial ethnic identities. So that just gives you a sampling of the complexity that can happen when we bring together multiple identities to understand disparities in minority stress. What I want to talk to you about, skipping over that, um, what I want to talk to you about is a second study that we did to try to get at this idea of intersectionality or how um, two minority identities could come together to make a unique experience with minority stress. So we had two types or groups of people in this research study, one that we classified as sexual minority only. So they identified as a sexual minority. However, their gender identity was cisgender. So their gender identity matched their sex assigned at birth. We also had the second group of people that we classified as sexual and gender minorities, where they had both minority identities. We were interested in, are there actual differences or disparities kind of within minority group so, such that you know, we normally look at disparities compared to a majority population, but Maybe there are these important differences we're not tapping into within group. So we compared these two groups on outcomes like depression and anxiety. We also compared them on minority stress experience in the form of anticipating discrimination from other people. How much do you anticipate experiencing unfair treatment? Um, and then support resources and um, including community connectedness, how connected to the LGBT community did individuals feel. We also thought if we found differences in mental health that we'd want to know, is minority stress a legitimate explanation for that? So somehow these sort of doubly minority individuals, this unique intersection, um, could minority stress be even greater in that population and explain any disparity found. So what we found is that there were significant differences in health outcomes, mental health outcomes. There were differences such that um, the sexual and gender minority group reported worse anxiety and worse stress symptoms, excuse me, depression symptoms. They also had more anticipated discrimination and fewer resources. So this 
kind of says from the start that, hey, actually there might be this disparity within the LGBT population where um, multiple minorities coming together could be um, worse off in some ways. So we did that test to see, does minority stress, that increased exposure to minority stress explain those mental health outcomes? And in fact, we found evidence for that. So I'm gonna show you two figures. Um, so, see if I can use this here. So sexual and gender and identity predicted more discrimination, uh, anticipated discrimination, and that explained the greater depression in that group compared to the sexual minority only group. And we also saw fewer support resources further explaining that health outcome. And this was specifically for depression. When we looked at anxiety as an outcome, we saw the same general trends with the exception of social support not predicting directly anxiety. So it really seemed that anxiety was mediated through that minority stress process. You see community connectedness hanging out here uh, in both figures, and that basically means that for people with lower levels of community connection, that this process was even stronger for them. So minority stress mediated more strongly. So being without those community connections seemed to make people a little bit more vulnerable. So again, these are cross-sectional data. Just caught myself saying make them more vulnerable. Um, I want to make sure I'm acknowledging that, that these are correlational data. These are in um, trending toward the paths that are similar with longitudinal data, but want to make that caveat. So in sum, we're finding health disparities within the LGBTQ community that need explored further. We are calling attention to this region of the country, a, con a kind of group of people that is understudied. And so given we have fewer community resources and supports available for LGBTQ people here, this seems ultra important to call attention to and do something about. Finally, this idea of multiple minority status um, or somehow looking at incorporating intersectionality um, seems to complicate the experience and this is just kind of one intersection. Um, imagine when we bring together even more identities um, and you know, how do we begin to think of doing that? So at this point, I've kind of outlined for you some of what I think is going on based on theory, also based in part on the findings that we have from our qualitative and quantitative research. And now it's like, okay, what do we do with this information? So I go to this kind of multi-level approach, which is in line with all of the types or levels of stigma that we can have, right? So if we have stigma at multiple levels, it makes sense that addressing the issue at multiple levels makes sense. So creating better physical environments, institutions that are supportive, um, policies that are inclusive, having safe and supportive communities, school systems, better interpersonal connections and kind of that connection with the community, building those opportunities. And of course, all of that in addition to the individual level and how to approach improved coping and um, addressing minority stress and how to kind of deal with that on a daily basis. So again, emphasizing this multi-level approach given we see stigma happening at all of these levels. So that brings me to the last part of the talk, which is really about how does this work impact work with clients? 
so as I was sitting with that, I really thought maybe I will start with any psychiatry guidelines that are out there. Um, so before I get there, I guess coming back to the Institute of Medicine's report, as you saw in our research, we sort of cover minority stress. We are considering some with intersectionality, but also that importance of understanding the social context. The American Psychiatric Association on their website has a link to best practices. And if you go to this link, there is a video that you can watch. And there's also some ideas listed for best practices. And I've summarized them here. I'm not going to go to the link for you, but I've, I've summarized the basic points. Those basic points include understanding that stigma has an impact in this population. So we've kind of covered that today. We've talked about that today. That it's important to create an affirming environment in a practice. So I would think that is a goal to figure out how to be affirming. What does that look like? We can talk a little bit about that in a minute. Understanding that there's no basis for conversion therapy. So the website states that. And that you can help families to come to a place of acceptance. And that once families come to a place of acceptance, that can actually reduce suicidality for LGBTQ people. So these came directly from this website. It also goes on to say that understanding that sex and gender and gender and sexuality are separate concepts. They're related, but they're separate. And how do we begin to use language that shows that? They also exist in continuums. So realizing that a binary may not be the best strategy for um, confirming or affirming a client's identity. That sexuality has three realms, and that these realms might not match so for a client, these may look different. Similarly, gender identity might not match biological sex. So really coming to a strong awareness about this. And of course, that biopsychosocial and cultural factors can also play a role. So that social context can play a role in people's gender and sexuality trajectories. So again, this is on the psychiatry website. I especially appreciated this last point as we consider intersectionality, multiple identities. So each individual is unique, composed of multiple identities that exist within and interact with other sociocultural realms. So it's not just sex, it's not just gender, it's not just sexuality, but it's socioeconomic status and race and ethnicity education, whatever we can think of that might sort of distinguish experience. I also sought out the other APA um, to figure out what are they saying about what psychologists should be doing to be working toward a best practice. And you know, the psychologists have documents on the website that are guidelines specifically. And kind of picked out the ones that were showing similar themes. So this is for working with lesbian, gay, and bisexual clients, where psychologists should strive to understand that this population experiences minority stress, that stigma that we were talking about. That multiple identities might come together, so the idea of intersectionality. So the challenges related to multiple and often conflicting norms, values, and beliefs when multiple identities come together. And that psychologists are encouraged to recognize how their attitudes and knowledge, so their own belief system, can impact work with clients. So addressing our own attitudes and beliefs. Very similar guidelines for working with trans. Again, those three, stigma, intersectionality, 
our own beliefs and values can impact clients. So considering these, in sum, again, those three, recognizing stigma could be in the room. It could be impacting a presenting problem. And recognizing the way that people's multiple identities come together could make their experience unique from what you thought it might be. And then recognizing our own belief system can actually play a role in how this client functions or their outcome. So as I was thinking about how do I, how do I bring that last piece in? Because we talked about stigma, we talked about intersectionality. That belief system piece is the one thing we didn't really cover. And so one of the ways that I usually talk about this in my courses when I teach, um, also in my LGBTQ ally training, I'm part of the Safe Zone community at ETSU, is this idea of privilege. And we all know what this means, right? On some level, we all recognize there are people with more privilege in society, less privilege in society, and we at least, I think, typically hear about it in relation to race. And so, as a white woman, I'm aware that I have more privilege than a woman of color, and maybe less privilege than a white male. As a sexual minority woman, I know, well, maybe, maybe that complicates it. So maybe, maybe I have less privilege than a heterosexual white woman. So when we think about privilege, when we think about multiple identities coming together, it complicates our experience of privilege. So just because someone is a white male, they may have other characteristics that reduce their privilege, um, or at least kind of complicate their experience. Um, so recognizing how identity is related to privilege is really important as we think about moving forward. In the 80s, Peggy McIntosh sort of put words to this idea of privilege. She called it an invisible weightless knapsack of special provisions, assurances, tools, maps, guides, code books, passports, visas, clothes. So anything that would be helpful along your journey that some people get this automatically, so sort of they're born into it, through no fault of their own, right? Um, you just sort of have this privilege or not. Similarly, some people are born into situations where they don't have these things. So again, it's not through any fault of their own. So it's this, just this, we have it or we don't sort of thing. What I think is important to talk about related to privilege is this idea of disconnect. I see this disconnect between privilege awareness and action. So I would bet that you all have thought about privilege in, you know, at some point in your life, and maybe even your own privilege, trying to figure out like, what, what is it that I have compared to other people. I think people are really are, are getting really good at recognizing their privilege. But the disconnect is when nothing is done about it. So I think that's where we can talk about bridging that gap between being aware of privilege and acting on it to improve the situation of clients in particular. So as we think about that very specific context, making inclusion visually salient. How do we let people know that we're actually accepting? So like I told you, the perception was that there are no friendly therapists. And I know plenty of friendly therapists. And so thinking through, well, what's, the, what's that disconnect? How do we get that information out there? How do we get visible? So really making an effort toward visibility. I think I forgot to mention something on the previous slide. I have a colleague that I was talking with, and um, they mentioned that 
they, they were accepting of lots of different people and that those people should assume that this person is generally accepting unless they do something otherwise to like indicate they're not. And I sat with that and I thought, that's not how stigma works. That as we saw, stigmatized people anticipate discrimination. They're sort of vigilant for who is safe, who is unsafe. And they're gonna assume the opposite that people aren't safe, they're not welcoming, they're not accepting, unless we tell them otherwise. So figuring out a way to get visible. Other ways, modifying paperwork to be inclusive, using affirmative language, openly affirming the identities of clients. So just being real, emphasizing privacy and confidentiality, that could be another. Asking people about minority stress experiences. Could that be playing a role in their presenting issue? And I don't want to assume that it is, right? But it could be. So there are ways that we can put this awareness into action. I think that if we did more of that, we'd have a better perception among the community that we have resources. Because I, I know we have some. We just have to make ourselves more visible, and we have to continue to educate ourselves. And, and I think it can grow. So back to your learning objectives. Hopefully you got there. Um, so hopefully you um, can walk away from today with a list of ideas about health disparities, mental health disparities that exist a potential explanation that is really common right now in research, this idea of increased exposure to minority stress, that intersectionality, multiple identities, can make that experience perhaps worse, or at least complicate it. And that finally there are ways to incorporate this information into practice, that we can impact work with LGBTQ clients by this awareness that we have and putting that awareness into action. So thank you for your time today. I want to end with some gratitudes uh, to my collaborators and to my students. So John Pachankis and Stephanie Shador um, are researchers working on the grant funded study and Sarah Job and Byron Brooks are my graduate students. Abby Mann has been heavily involved in the process of qualitative coding and writing that paper. My lab, obviously funding agency, and also um, all of the LGBTQ participants and stakeholders that have generously given of themselves. So that is all. Thank you. So I believe we have lots of time for questions, at least some time. I'll try not to stumble with my words then. Um, so this is um, a wondering, it's not a, I don't expect you to have that answer. Okay. Um, but I was thinking about the map that you had posted yeah. up there and noticed that New York and Pennsylvania and even Virginia are warmer climates than Tennessee. Um, and also the Appalachian Mountains runs through all of those states. Mm. And I know your study identified your participants as Appalachian. Right. But I sort of wonder what the results might look like if you were to um, do something similar with uh, members of the community in, in New York, mm. um, near the Appalachian region. Are, is it still a pretty culturally homogeneous group or is it more diverse group and do they feel warmer or cooler? Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. I know that the goal um, is to apply for more grants to look at other, kind of expand our current study to other Appalachian areas. Um, I think that might be a really good rationale for
going to states that overall are kind of warmer or more accepting in policies, for example, to see, really get at what is it. Um, I know the kind of thought is that the cultural attitudes of this region, kind of the intersection, if you will, with the South and perhaps um, the Appalachian culture and how highly valued religion is, kind of that Bible Belt idea, um, or the buckle of the Bible Belt, whatever this region is referred to as, um, that there's something unique about that. And so that's a great idea to kind of get at all of these different comparison groups. That would be really interesting. Thank you. Did you have a question? Actually, I had a couple of uh, questions. One was, uh, isn't your study of uh, sexual and gender minority a template for what we need to do more generally in this area of research in terms of looking at intersections of different groups and trying to fill in the gaps of knowledge about populations that way rather than what more traditional research does, which is make homogeneous conclusions about populations? Yes, <laughs> um, I, I agree with that. I think it's very hard to do intersectionality research well. Um, I, I'm just now kind of getting into the, the heart of that literature and a lot of it tends to be qualitative in nature because of how complex when you build in kind of empirically all of these different categories, how they might come together and you have all of these kind of labels on people and the people are in buckets and and it, it sort of loses the meaning of understanding the depth of like what it represents. And typically that means privilege and power differences. And so if it's just the empirical. But I, I agree that that seems to be the direction that would make the most sense. And if you find similarities, then you can make that homogeneous sort of statement, right? Um, but until we look at those differences um, or really understand those intersections, I think we can't do that fully. And the second question uh, is partly uh, on the basis of the background of my own interest. Um, for me, your lecture really points to another special area of minority stress related to the LGBTQ community, and that's uh, HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you would want to make any remarks in that regard. Um, I think that's an excellent point. Um, I know that some of the health behaviors that we tend to see as disparities um, kind of go along the lines of the risky sex behaviors, for example, that could put someone at risk. Um, I think there, there's multiple levels that you could probably approach an answer to that question. And one thing that comes to mind is with stigma and minority stress, people might not be willing to identify themselves as a sexual minority, for example, and if they're kind of living privately, um, they might put other partners at risk um, to avoid stigma attached to the label of being a sexual minority. So I, oh, there's so many ways I could respond to that. Um, do you have a thought given that's a particular interest? Well, along the lines of your lecture, a major, you know, uh, kind of impact I thought was relevant was to look at it as an additional aspect of minority stress and the interaction, you know, with uh, the LGBTQ okay. community in terms of health outcomes uh, okay. more generally. Okay, thank you. Um, and kind of the intersection of having an HIV diagnosis or not, and how that kind of Im impacts, okay. As well as this, just the stress related to, and this is more specific uh, for your lecture, different regions of the country having similarly different uh, attitudes to HIV AIDS mm -hmm. uh, as to the LGBT community. Yep. 
Um, if an individual is homeless, yeah. young individual is homeless as a result of being LGBTQ, is there anything to refer them to? Is there anything in place or is it all couch surfing? You know, I, I know some of the stakeholders that participated in our interviews said that that was an experience of working with these young people. And to my knowledge, and maybe others know more things than I do about the resources, to my knowledge, there is no LGBTQ specific um, housing resource. So I think that could be a real resource in our community. Um, I have a friend who has talked about just because, you know, it hurts her heart to know this. She's like, maybe I should open one. It's like, well, you know, you've never done anything like that. I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think the more resources we have, the better. I think there's also an interesting intersection that I'd like to research, um, kind of going to maybe the other extreme with age and understanding kind of elder resources. And as this community ages, what is our, um, what is our place like here? And um, I recently had a, a friend call one of our local kind of assisted living slash nursing home and ask if they were friendly to same-sex couples. And they said, well, we don't actively discriminate. We don't have any currently, and we're faith-based. So those were the like, three things that were said. And so I you know, don't have it know how to take that exactly. So I think all the way around, it seems like we need to figure out our resource situation for this population. Um, I recently convened a small group of people to talk about starting or having, hosting a summit, like to figure out who all needs to be in the room to talk about resources for this community and then kind of build that. But does that get at your... Yeah. Are there models in other communities that work? I think that would be a starting point. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to be involved in the summit? <laughs> okay. Interesting true story. I was at Christmas dinner with my boyfriend, and we were talking to a physician who's in rural Virginia. And one of the things you did... Uh, I was at Christmas dinner with my boyfriend, and I was talking to an active physician in Virginia having Christmas dinner. One of the biggest barriers he had, we were talking about PrEP, was his uncomfortableness with addressing sexuality, particularly with a male who he suspected was gay, yeah. Uh, of the stigma between him and them of just being uncomfortable bringing up that subject. Right. And I'd like to know your views on that and how we deal with it. I think that's a really great point. I, I can't say that specific example came up in our interviews, but certainly the idea of interaction with physicians came up and that not being ideal, let's say that. Um, but that's a really good point. I think, in my opinion, much more training needs to be incorporated into medical school to deal with these issues, to get people comfortable um, role playing, whatever it might take. I know that there's some that is done, <laughs> maybe. <She's looking> at me. <laughs> um, and I know there's also a group in family medicine that's really focused on training residents and physicians. So my hope is that we can get there. Um, but I, I mean, I just, I, I, it could get better. Yes, please, okay, Bill, so. please. Hi, I'm, I'm Bill Finger. I'm a professor in the Department of Psychiatry. I do some training for the med students in sexuality, especially around diversity issues. Yeah. Um, so we try to do some of this. Dr. Woodside, others in the room help. We do role plays, um, try to get the students to recognize some of the challenges they're gonna have, try to get them to explore some of their own issues around uh, these issues and diversity. And it's a challenge. It's, it's, it's very much a challenge to get uh, new developing providers at a place where they can do this comfortably 
um, and recognizing the barriers that they're going to have. And as a little plug, we do have a panel of providers um, and uh, consumers as part of that training, and I'm always interested in having people who might uh, be able to bring a perspective. So um, look me up. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. Um, so the question I have is, as a, a clinician, I'm sometimes seeing um, these young folks that are struggling. Um, they're struggling with trying to fit in, you know, they may be new to say, ETSU, trying to fit in here, which there's a lot of, you know, folks that they can relate to here and they usually find that out. But then they're struggling with their family of origin, you know, acceptance, et cetera. So where I struggle with is um, how do we get the help for the parents mm. who are struggling with, and, and you know, parents eventually, I think most, maybe I'm wrong in that assumption, do come around, may take a variety of ways. Is there somewhere that I could be able to tell the individual I'm seeing to maybe, again, I know the acceptance level of the parent or whatever may vary in terms of whether they want to be, for, for support for them to understand and become more accepting and to understand all the issues, basically, that yeah. their child is, uh, is going through and then losing their support right. with a financial, health care, you know, support, whatever, right. is very, uh, just adding so much to, the, to their already yeah, existence. Thank you for bringing that up. I um, agree that for parents, it's a, also a coming out process, right? So it's a process of coming to understand the child's identity. And I, I honestly don't have a solid sense because of the research is so limited in this region anyway. But you know, do parents come around? I hope so, eventually. I mean, I know we also, as a cultural value here, value family. And so my hope is that that happens over time. I do see students on campus that are kind of worried about coming out to their family because they're financially dependent on them. And so maybe they don't come out to their parents until they're done with college. And then you know, how do you deal with that kind of lack of authenticity piece? And so I, I've seen where students may have sort of multiple identities, it seems like, when they go home versus when they're at ETSU um, where they can be freer to be themselves. Um, so I know that there is a local chapter of PFLAG. Some of us in the room have participated in that in the past and that is a resource presumably for parents. There is a national organization uh, as well so they can reach out to the national organization as well as the local one. I know the local one meets monthly um, I, you know, I'm not a parent of a person, so I don't know if um, we have evidence of PFLAG being helpful to people, if anyone knows in the room of other resources. Uh, I imagine individual therapy could be helpful for parents, but I don't know how you get them in the room. <laughs> yes, Jane. Actually, I, I got the mic, so I'll just, um, my name is George Brown, I'm a professor Hi. of psychiatry here, and I've done a little bit of work on health disparities in trans people over the last 30 years or so. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the points I wanted to echo with, with Bill, because I'm one of the people that helps train the medical students, is the average number of hours that medical graduates, student graduates are exposed to with gender and sexual minority issues is two hours total. Um, and we are, we are one of the places that actually is ahead of that um, abysmal norm across the country. Um, and I certainly appreciate somebody other than me giving grand rounds on topics like this, so thank you very much for that. Um, the other comment is, the, uh, in health disparities, of course, the, if you don't have control groups, what's really the cause of the disparity? Um, and that's really one of the biggest challenges of doing this kind of work, um, which is what I've focused on in the last five years or so. Yep. Um, because we have such a comorbidly problematic part of the country with a lot of overlap. Um, and the access issues are so real, and I get a lot of calls from, including in, in our VA, which is the largest healthcare provider for trans healthcare in the country, and still people have attitudinal issues where they can't get access, don't feel free to um, talk about their issues because they've had bad experiences, not that they fear they will, but because they have. Um, and I get a lot of these calls, and many of the calls I get are the same as 25 years ago. So as much as we have come 
um, a long way in 25 or 30 years. From my perspective, there's still major areas of improvement attitudinally and knowledge-based both that remain untouched um, from many of the, the personal experiences I've had with, with patients in this part of the country for sure. Thank you so much and I am aware of your work and your name so thanks. Thanks for all that you do. Um, so while we're getting the mic to Jane, I just wanted to say that regarding young people, um, I know that GSAs, so Gay Straight Alliances in high schools, can actually be helpful. There's research nationally to show that. And we have two GSAs locally, one in Kingsport and one in Johnson City, but I've heard that it's very hard to have those and that the advisors are always getting pushback from other teachers and from parents. And so I think oh, it's so hard to have resources making an impact and, and that stay, resources that stay. Um, but Jane, please address Yeah, my only PFLAG. caveat about PFLAG locally is it's my impression that it's mainly attracted in supporting LGBTQ people. Yes. That Jack and I are parents of a gay son. And when we went, when it was first forming, occasionally a parent would show up and we'd go up and say, hi, we're parents too, if you'd like to talk. And they kind of uniformly fled. <laughs> so it, yeah. it's there and, and it should be doing that, but locally I'm not sure it's I evolved think, yeah. in the way that it is. I think that is the reality and perhaps the reality because there are no resources for the LGBT community that that has become a, a, not like a known place where you can go and kind of interact with safe people. So, but I guess maybe the national group would, would have other, I know they have um, on their website a lot of books to download and other resources, but again, that interaction piece. I'm looking at Carrie, I don't know if you have any other ideas about that to put you on the spot. <laughs> parents who were wanting to support their kids, but not very many parents who were at a loss about what to do. I've only heard from parents who were at a loss on an individual basis when they reached out to me for therapy services. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a long time ago, but I don't know uh, where people might be, where parents might be getting their help now. Yeah. Thank you. I just want, I'm recently, I'm an openly gay man and I recently moved here for school to, from Fort Lauderdale. So I would say in the community, there is a huge lack of resources here, even on campus. There's mm -hmm. one student group which has a, that I spoke at on prep two weeks ago, but it's a very small, very internalized, very scared of their own shadow, and I'm just saying that that they they have self-stigmatized them as a group, and I would say that to them personally. And there is just a huge lack of resources, especially if you want a place that has positive role models, that people are doing something. The only community resource that I know of is the gay bar. And, um, I mean, it's something for our community to look at. Thank you. Um, I know that there was plans, there have been plans for a community center um, that was being started by a couple of independent individuals. I don't know what the status of that is. Do you happen to know? My, my sense from the grapevine is that that no longer is happening. So um, I know there was a lot of effort with trying to start a community center, but uh, I think the, the task was too great, perhaps. I'm not, I'm not sure of all the details. <laughs> 
Well, there yeah. is there are, is at least one, maybe two churches in the community that are very supportive of this community. Yes. First Presbyterian Church, Elizabeth Tun, is very mm -hmm. firm. And I think the Unitarian Church as well. Yes. So, for you to know. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. There definitely are some friendly churches. There actually, I can't remember which church, but there is a Pentecostal church that has a gay minister or pastor um, in Johnson City. Yeah. So we've got two or three. Yeah. I'll make this quick because I'm scared of crowds. But um, as thank just. Thank you for being brave. You're welcome. <laughs> As just a student, and I kind of see all of my friends, a lot of my friends are gay too, like a lot of them. But um, I think seeing what they're scared of, mostly coming from their parents, that parents should at some point be disregarded. And I don't say that to offend anyone, I promise, but once they come to college, I feel like, because they're happy here, and like you all said, they go home, and they have to face that. But once they're here, I feel like the priority should be, are they safe? Do they have resources? And the conversation about resources is had repeatedly, and it's a cycle, it just keeps being had. And all we have is conversation, and we have to have initiatives, you know? So yeah. start a fund, or have the conversation with the right people and not just amongst ourselves. Yes. I wrote more down, hang on one second, because I forget really fast. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, so back to their safety. Um, we know that people who are shunned and sent into a depression, literally sent into a depression, they don't just slip there. But suicide and depression, it's, it's kind of sick to me in the fact that we want to have these conversations. I've actually tried to have one of these conversations and I was told no, and I facilitate a lot of events on campus, but I would have to have a security detail to get all of my gay friends in one spot. That's not okay. No. That's in no way okay. I'm putting on an event right now that I have to have a security detail for, but it's not for the gay community. But I, I think that's kind of sad and there should be consequences to the people who make it in a hard environment because everyone has the right to be here everyone who got into this school, yes. no matter what anyone thinks, parents, students, faculty, it doesn't matter, yeah. you know, so. Thank you for that reminder that we need to do. More action, I agree. Um, and to speak to your point about um, having security detail, I was reminded by, um, of the pride parade that happened. I don't know if you participate, people participated uh, last fall in Johnson City's first official, I guess, pride parade. Um, but it was a wonderful event, lots of people, um, and then that was the first time at Founders Park that I had seen it ever like blocked off and gated and snipers on roofs, and it was just like, it was both exhilarating and fear-inducing because of that constant reminder of, well, could something happen to somebody? So, thanks for that. Well, thank you, everyone. I think we're going to have to cut it here. It was a great discussion. Thank you for all thank your you all questions. Thank you so much. And thank you to Dr. Williams. So let me just put a plug in for our next Grand Rounds, which is in two weeks, not next week, two weeks in this room. And um, I'm George Brown, Associate Chair for Veterans Affairs and Psychiatry. And I'm hosting the speakers, um, Jillian Shippard, who is one of the co-directors of the LGBT national programs in the VA. And she's also a, a leading VA expert on women's health and women's trauma issues. So she will be here talking more about the latter than the former of those two areas of expertise in two weeks. Hope to see you there. <laughs>